You know, as I was trying to think about what I should talk about today, I was having a hard time because, as you know, the Army has no issues. We're not facing any difficult issues at all, and there's really very little to talk about. But so I was able to finally find something that we could probably discuss. But as uh, General Sullivan was reading my biography, you know, there was when I was asked to be the chief, there was a joke made in one of the papers that said, you know, he was asked to close down Iraq. He was asked to close down Joint Force Command. Does this mean he's going to close down the Army? And after the last few years, that, that although it was meant as a joke, that poster might not be too far off, unfortunately. What I wanted to do is quickly uh, talk about some of the things that are important to me. I want to talk a little bit about modernization and the future uh, today. I think it's an, we, don't we haven't talked a lot about that because we've been so involved with the budget and strength and all these other issues. I think it's important for us to really have, a, let me kind of walk you through at least what we're thinking, where we're headed uh, in that area. But before I, I, I start, I, I always like to remind everybody that as we stand here, you know, people tend to think that you know, the Army now is out of Iraq and Afghanistan, there's not much going on. But it's reinforced to me as I travel around the Army how busy we are. It, it is not slowed down. If you go to any installation, when I, you know, a few months ago I was out at Fort Carson and the 4th Infantry Division was laying out all the missions they have for the next three years. It's mind-boggling to just listen to what they're doing. You go down to Fort Bragg and you go to the 82nd Airborne Division, 18th Airborne Corps, the same thing. You go out to Fort Bliss, Texas, that I met with 1st Armored Division and the missions that they have and the requirements they have worldwide outside of Afghanistan is quite significant. The Army is not standing still. The Army is doing many, many, many things in order for us to shape the future environment and to prevent conflict around the world. A lot of people don't know is I have a battalion commander and about 50 soldiers uh, sitting at the embassy in South Sudan. And they have been there now for several weeks. We have forces that are ta tailored and scaled, that are conducting operations, conducting training, building partner capacity, and doing many things in many parts of the world. And that's what we'll continue to do. And oh, by the way, we still have about 30,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. We still have another 20,000 around other places in the Middle East. We have soldiers in Turkey. We've deployed our air defense capability to Guam in response to North Korea. So I just always remind everybody that we are not standing still. People seem to think, okay, there's nothing for the Army to do. They're not very busy. All, every one of our components are incredibly busy and continue to be. And I just always like to remind everybody of that as we move forward. I want to really, uh, you know, what, what are we trying to do? Listen. In, in my mind, there's certain things that we have to attempt to do as we move forward. One is, you know, we have to remain a, a highly trained, ready, professional army as we move forward. We can never walk away from that. Everybody asks me about taking care of soldiers. The way we take care of soldiers is to make sure they are trained and ready to do the missions we ask them. So when we ask them to deploy somewhere, they are prepared. That's what we owe our soldiers. And we have to make sure as we move forward that we are doing that for them. The Army is, is uniquely organized and has capabilities that are distinct from many of the other services. Our ability to organize ourselves with a variety of capabilities, whether it be, whether it be light, heavy armor, whether it be air defense, whether it be fires, whether it be special operations capability, those are found and developed in the Army. Our ability to deliver logistics around the world is unmatched. Our ability to provide intelligence support is unmatched. Our ability that, that is conducted by our Corps of Engineers and what they do around the world and in the United States is unmatched. These are competencies that nobody else has. And it's these unique capabilities that we need to build on as we move to the future. We are the only ones who can deliver these capabilities. And we have to make sure that we continue to do that. I've set five priorities. I think most of you have probably seen them. But number one is about developing leaders. 
All we have to do is look at the papers every single day and understand that the world is becoming more complex every day. And in order for us to stay in front of that, we have to develop leaders. And in fact, I think responsibilities in a world where information travels so fast will get pushed down to lower and lower levels. And so we have to develop our captains faster than when I was a captain. We have to develop our lieutenant colonels faster. We have to develop them in many more diverse understanding of the social, economic, cultural, religious environments that are around the world, because they're going to have to operate in those environments. We have to have leaders who can, who can do critical thinking under pressure. We have to have leaders who can make tough decisions at the right time. And so that's why that's always will be our number one priority. It is an advantage that we have today. It is an advantage that we must sustain into the future. The one thing that every day is apparent to me as I think about where we're going is the, is the change or the de continued development of our non-commissioned officer corps. When I deal with sergeant majors, when I deal with master sergeants, when I deal with sergeant first class, the level that they are at is so much higher than it was just 10, 12 years ago. It is nowhere close to where it was when I came into the Army 38 years ago. Their mental agility, their understanding of the issues we have is at the highest level I've ever seen it. And we have to continue to develop that. Because that's what makes us different than anybody else is our non-commissioned officer corps. We have to be a global responsive army. What does that mean? Leaner, smaller, tailable, scalable. We have to be expeditionary. We have to, we have to go back to our expeditionary mindset. We have to be prepared to deploy very quickly. We have to get there in small packages and then potentially build on that. We have to get there with the least amount of support necessary. We have to be able to go in remote areas. We have to be able to go anywhere in the world. We have to build on our advantage of tactical operations strategic mobility. We have to build on our capability and our our tactical, our operational, strategical command and control systems. Our command and control systems are too heavy today. I've challenged our people that says, why can I sit here at my chair, pull out my smartphone, and I can talk to every continent in the world with my one little smartphone? But why is it when I want to do com communications, I got to bring 50 trucks and 300 soldiers? Why is that? Why is that? We can't do that anymore. So we got to figure out how, how do we leverage the technologies that are out there? How do we leverage our ability to reduce our footprint, to have better communications, to have secure data? We're working on making sure that as you're in a C-17 flying from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to wherever, while you're on that C-17, you have complete visibility of the operation that you're going to conduct wherever you are in the world. We're building that capability. And then we'll move it across the entire force. And then what do we do when we get on the ground? Do they, have, do they continue to have that complete visibility? Because in the world we're in, information is everything. The ability for the commander on the ground to understand what he's getting into is one of the most important things that we have to provide him. And then he'll be able to execute from there. We have to understand what's going on in each one of the combatant commanders area, regionally engaged. That's just not a phrase. We've been doing that in the past. But the emphasis is different. We have to understand what's going on in the Korea Peninsula, and it can't just be the 2nd Infantry Division who understands that. We have to understand what's going on in Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and Egypt and Iraq and Afghanistan. Just in case, we have to be prepared. We, have to, we want to try to shape that. We want to try to prevent a large-scale conflict. But we have to understand what's going on in those areas. We have to continue to build strong partnerships with our NATO allies. 
So we have to figure out ways of how we're going to do that. The JMTC at Graf and Ver Hohenfels is going to be an international training center where we continue to share technology, share concepts, work together. Because the future is working in coalitions and multi with multinational partners. How do we develop that? These are the kind of things that we have to do when we, when we talk about regional engagement. Look at the African continent. We've conducted somewhere between 80 and 100 missions in Africa over the last eight months. Some of them are 10 people, some are 200 people, but they're key missions supporting the AFRICOM commander's objectives across Central and North Africa. We have to build a force that understands what's going on there. And we will continue to do that as we move forward. We have to be a ready and modern army. I already, readiness is key. We're reinvigorating our combat training centers. Our units are going to go through the combat training centers. We are developing scenarios that are incredibly complex that reflect what we believe the future will look like. And we will continue to iterate that and improve that as we go forward. That's to ensure that our soldiers are trained. And it's not just about brigade combat teams. It is centered around brigade combat teams. But it's about air ground integration. It's about logistical integration. It's about mission command and the ability to use mission command in an, in an incredibly complex operation. So we're focused on that in ensuring we have readiness. We're focused on, on ensuring that we go back to understanding strong home station training programs, which we frankly have not done in the last five, six, seven years, because it's been very simple. You come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, you rest for a little bit, you do some training, and you head back. We now have to be able to do things in a very diverse way. So home station training compared to the combat training centers is going to be important. We're invigorating our exercise program. Every exercise that we do will be done at several levels with all components. Because it's important that we train our leaders to operate. The one thing that was clear in the last 10 or 12 years is the Army has the only organizations that you can build JTFs around our divisions and our cores. You can plug. That's why we've had those over the last several years. We've got to continue to build on that, build that expertise, and figure out how we adjust that for the different missions that we might be asked to do. So that's maintaining the readiness that we think is important. Let me talk just a minute about modernization. The, the one thing it will always stay is we, we get a, our modernization program will still be centered around the soldier and squad. They are the foundation of who we are. And yes, sometimes we are who our history is. And as I remember back to 2002 and three, I remember that our infantry squads were not all equipped properly. We had tiered equipping readiness. Some units were properly equipped with all the equipment that we expected our squads to have. We fixed that problem. We're going to sustain that. We're going to continue to build on it to make sure that we have the best equipment for our soldiers and squads. Because as I just talked about, we're going to be deploying in smaller capabilities. And when I say squads, I, I define it as bigger than that. It's just not infantry squads. It's our logistic squads. It's our artillery squads. It's all, you know what I'm talking about. It's making sure that they have the right capabilities and necessities. Because we're going to ask them to go somewhere. And we need to make sure that they have the right equipment. That's number one. We all know that because of the budget, our modernization strategy is going to be a bit delayed. We're not going to be able to do everything that we wanted to do. But everything that we do must be affordable, must be versatile, must be tailable. 
Additionally, over the next few years, we're going to have to rely on some mature technologies. We'll continue to modernize the Paladin. We'll continue to make cost-effective improvements in the Abrams tank. We're going to continue to improve the Bradley fighting vehicle. We're going to continue to improve M4 carbines, M4A1 carbines. But we are going to build, we're going to build new when it's absolutely essential, JLTV, AMP-V, the replacement for the 113. We have to have these systems. Do we need a new infantry fighting vehicle? Yes. Can we afford a new infantry fighting vehicle now? No. So what I'm hoping for is technology will continue to allow us so in three to four years from now, we'll be able to build an infantry fighting vehicle that is absolutely necessary for us as we go forward. We're going to continue to modernize our aviation fleet, but we can't afford our aviation fleet today. We can't afford it. So we're going to have to make some difficult decisions and our modernization strategy. And we, we're going to have to reduce the number of systems that we have. We're going to have to focus on that. Is that what I want? No. But we have to do the best we can to mitigate the risk as we move forward. And we have to make, the, make sure the systems we have are the best systems possible. So we will continue to modernize our UH-60 fleet. We'll continue to modernize our CH-47 fleet. We'll continue to modernize our Apaches. And we'll get those in the hands of our soldiers so they can train and do the best we can so we're prepared for the next fight. Does that mean I, I, I'm walking away from a scout helicopter? No, I think we need a scout helicopter. But we can't afford one right now. So we're going to have to figure out what we do as we move forward. During this next few years, it's important that we invest in science and technology. And we have to really choose where we invest. We have to, we have to be able to find leap ahead technologies. You know, as I look at our aviation fleet, yes, we want to continue to, to invest in new engines. Yes, we want to look at vertical lift. And what does that mean for the future? Well, yes, we want to look at manned, unmanned teaming. But what is that leap ahead technology that we need that can make a real difference for our soldiers on the ground? Is it materials technology that allows us to decrease the weight so we can be more expeditionary? Over the last several years, what we've done is we've traded mobility for survivability. We got to get back in line. I need mobility. I need tactical mobility for the future. So we need to move towards mobility and, uh, and, move, and try to figure out how do we sustain survivability while increasing mobility? How do we increase lethality of our systems but, re, but increase mobility at the same time? Those are the things we need. We need to leverage commercial technology. I gave you an example of, of IT. How are we doing that? We've got to figure out how we're going to maintain our industrial base. It's a key to us. But we've got to focus that, and we've got to make sure that we have a strong organic base, industrial base and, and, a, and a private industrial base that will continue to support us. And these S&T investments, in my mind, are very, very important. We are, you've heard over the last couple days that I think the TRADOC commander and the vice chief has talked about this concept of Army 2025 that we're talking about. I think it's important that we need about 10 years to look at where we are going and what we need 20 and 30 years from now. We got a bit short-sighted when we were fighting the two wars. Absolutely understandable. But we now need to start thinking about what we need to look like in 2025. There's going to be continued pressure on the budget. So what do we need to do 
in order to ensure that we have the army to, to meet the missions of the future? Are we going to have to operate in what some people call mega cities? We're going to have to deploy very quickly to many different places. How, how do we organize ourselves to do that? So we're putting something together that allow us to study what we've done over the last 10, 12 years, but also look at what we need to do in the future. We need to maximize our formations. How do we maximize our formations? What I'd rather have is more formations that are smaller and more effective. That's what I'd like to see 10 years from now. And those formations are built on technology insert. They're built on new concepts, both, both tactical and operational concepts. And we think about how we organize ourselves. Do we organize ourselves the same today, uh, tomorrow as we do today? We need about 10 years to sort that out. So what I want to do is sustain ourselves over the next seven, eight, nine years, and then we're prepared then to move forward. And if it can happen faster, good. But we have to start that now. It's key. Again, and I go back, what are we looking for? Smaller, leaner, agile, responsive. How do we reduce our formations while maintaining the same capability? I don't know the answer. Is it revolutionary or evolutionary? Could be both. But some of the concepts we have to look at is manned, unmanned teaming. What does that mean for the future? Both in ground and aviation. What are innovative ways for us to provide logistics? Reduce our tail. 3D printing. I don't know what that means yet. I understand 3D printing, but I don't know what it means to our organizations. I don't know how do we take that and utilize that in order to reduce our footprint for the future. So what I'm looking for is how we optimize our combat units, how we increase expeditionary capability, how we more effectively mission tailor regionally align ourselves and be globally responsive? How do we provide flexible JTF-capable headquarters? How do we continue to develop forces that are capable of joint entry operations? How do we have forces that are optimized to defend the homeland, specifically seaborne operations and counterproliferation capabilities? And how do we work to counter A squared AD? These are the challenges we have. These are the challenges that I give you. These are the challenges that I've given the Army as we move forward. They will be essential to us as we, as we look ahead. Let me, let me stop there, but let me finish by just telling you that during this time of, of budget reductions, during this time of working through some complex problems, the one thing that remains steady is our soldiers. Our soldiers remain steady. As I travel around, I'm inspired every day by what they do. I'm inspired by their leaders. I'm inspired by their dedication. I'm inspired by they continue to work towards being the best that they possibly can be. We owe it to them to make sure that we provide them what's necessary for them to be successful in the future. The strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldiers. The strength of our soldiers is our families. And that's what makes this army strong. Thank you very much. Good morning, General. Uh, Tony Bertuca, inside the Army. I wanted to return a moment to the, the ground combat vehicle. So, so now that the budget being where it is, will there be a formal follow-on effort, or is this going to be a sort of a retrenching to see what the new requirements for the future might be? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, we're hoping for a follow-on effort. I mean, I think this is, the one thing I want to make clear is actually I was very pleased with the progress of the ground combat vehicle. Uh, I think we had the requirements right. We were starting to see really good development by the contractors involved with this. 
And so it's important that we carry that forward. So we're trying to figure out how we do that as we move forward. Hi, General. Thanks for joining us this morning. Jen Judson with Inside the Army. Um, given what we know about the budget and the potential restructure of Army assets, what does the Guard need and what is your thinking on what the Guard will be postured or sized to do versus what the Army will be postured or sized to do and how will the Army and the Guard complement one another? Well, 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 first, the National Guard is the Army. I want to make that very clear. There's not an Army and a National Guard. The Army is the active component, the National Guard, and the U.S. <laughs> Army Reserve. That's how we've operated for the last 200 and whatever years. And that's how we've operated for the last 12 or 13 years specifically. We need a combination of all of those. We can't afford an active component of, of a million people. So we need people who are willing to volunteer part time to do the job that we need them to do. And that system has worked very successfully. So as we move forward, as, a, as, the, as the Secretary's total Army policy is very clear, is as much as possible we want the Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve to look the same as the active component. And we're continuing to work our way through that. Will there be exceptions? Yes. But you got to understand each is different. Each does different things. But they are both critical to everything that we do. All three of them. Good. General, to follow up on the Guard question, you mentioned, for example, aviation uh, particularly. Uh, you know, A, how you divide up roles between the Guard, the reserve component in general, and the active duty depends in large part on how fast you think we're going to need to react to future contingencies. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people in the Guard community who say, you know, they're taking away our stuff, they don't respect listen, listen, us, listen, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to get into specifics, but here's the issue. The Army has to pay a $79 billion bill over the next five years. That's simple, $79 billion. So we have to organize ourselves in the most efficient, effective way possible. As I said earlier, I can't afford all the fleets of aircraft I have right now. We can't afford them. So this is, not a, this is about affordability. We don't have the money to sustain the systems we have. So we got to make the best use out of the aviation that we have. That's simple. That, that's the issue. It's nothing else. People want to make it into something it isn't. This is about not having enough money to sustain the fleets we have now. And so we have to make some tough decisions in order for us to have a, a fleet that, that we can train pilots, that we can sustain. And I can't sustain all the fleets we have right now. It is impossible under the budget, the budget we've been given. And so we're trying to make the best decisions possible that makes the best business sense, that makes the best operational sense as we move forward. And that doesn't mean we think it's the right way necessarily, but it's the best way forward. And that's why we have to make these difficult decisions. And we'll roll that out once we submit our budget, which, by the way, we have not submitted our budget yet. I remind everybody of that. So, uh, you know, there's been no final decision made. They will be made very shortly. But we know that we have to fundamentally understand how we can afford an aviation fleet for the next 10 years. We can't afford our current fleet. So we have to make adjustments. And the majority of the adjustments are going to happen in our active component aviation units. Uh, Ellen Mitchell, Inside the Army. Uh, you touched on... Uh, ground vehicles and aviation with uh, the new budgetary restrictions going forward. Uh, but what do these restrictions mean uh, for the Army's network modernization efforts in FY15? Uh, do you think you're going to retrench uh, with a smaller, more tactical network uh, than what was originally planned? It's going to slow down. Our, it, so the programs, you know, as we move forward, all our programs have slowed down. And so what's going to happen is we're not going to field as much as we initially thought we were going to be able to field to our units. So what, what happens is the number of units being fielded is less. And it takes longer now to do that. What we'll continue to do is input uh, uh, improvements as we field down the road. So we're not retrenching, but we're slowing down the fielding of our IT technologies as we go forward. 
General, uh, Brennan McGarry, military.com. Had a couple questions. One, just to follow on the, uh, the comments made about the Guard and the yeah. aviation fleet. Can you just talk I didn't a make a comment about the Guard and aviation fleet. I made a comment about the aviation fleet. Can you just talk a little bit about the, what you're doing to, to sort of uh, assuage the concerns of some of the, uh, the, the Guard uh, generals uh, about the plan or, or your colleagues about the plan? And then two, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of industry folks here. Can you, can you speak a little bit about what the Army wants to do in this sequestration era uh, to, to, do, to, to move forward on, on some of these programs? I mean, obviously there's delays. And, and some of the new systems aren't going to be built, but can you talk a little bit a bit to what, you know, beyond just the investments in existing equipment you want to make, you know, where you might target some of those monies uh, in the future? Okay, I, I want to make sure I understand your question. So the bottom line is, if it's aviation you're talking about, we're continuing to invest in the modernization of our, for example, our UH-60s. We're going to UH-60 mics. We're getting rid of the alpha models. We'll be the Lima's, then we'll go to Mike's. That's going to continue throughout the Palm. We're continuing to build CH-47 Foxtrots, which are important. We're continuing to go to the, the Apache Block 3 as we move forward. So all of that continues as we go forward, because it's key. So we've tried to save the modernization and, and continued improvement in our aviation systems. There are some key systems that we have to replace. The Humvee, we just have to replace. So it's the JLTV. We've got to replace the 113, so it's the AMP B. So we're going to continue to move forward with those programs. We're going to continue to, to do modernization improvements when necessary on the, on the, on the tank. We're going, to, we're going to do some modernization and improvements on the Bradley. So, but, and we're going to continue to, could continue to improve our IT as we move forward as well. So those are the things that we're investing in as we go forward. Morning, General. Um, I'm Ann Reese. I work for the House Appropriation Defense Subcommittee. Um, I was one of the original authors of the Financial Management Report, Chapter 23 on Contingency Operations, and I spent all of Christmas Eve day giving my bosses options as to how to move money, O&M money, um, into OCO. My intent was to protect readiness. Um, do you agree that was the right thing to do, and could you um, help me understand how to explain to the press that it was a good thing to do to protect readiness, if you agree. Yeah, so, so first, uh, thank you for asking me a question, because I, I, I thought I was, got caught up in a press conference here, so I'm glad that somebody else besides the press asked me a question, so thanks for that. Um, so my general comment is anything that gives us more O&M is an, really, really good. Because the issue is, again, readiness. So what we said all along was we knew with the law, which is sequestration, we had a hole. And it's a three to four year hole. And that hole is in, in, is in readiness. So I was very clear, I think I said at AUSA in October, I made the comment, we have two brigade combat teams that are ready. With the changes in O&M, that's going to allow us to spill a significant amount of more brigade combat team readiness aviation readiness, combat service support readiness over the next 10 months. And although it won't be where we want it to be, it'll be much better than it was. And so for me, that's critical. So everybody asks me what keeps you up at night. It's the fact that somebody might ask me to deploy 20, 30,000 soldiers and they're not ready. Well, because of this, I think, you know, when we get to the summer, we're going to start, we're going to be generating forces that are ready. And that's, that's important. And then, you know, so both, both getting more in, in OCO and, and in the base, all of that is significantly helpful towards achieving uh, those ends. And, and we're very pleased with the outcome of our O&M budget. For it. it is much better than we expected it, and it's going to make a huge difference in 14. 15 is another challenge because it, 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 it kind of goes down a little bit for us in 15, so we have to work our way through that. But 14 has been really good for us in terms of O&M. Chief, a uh, quick question about uh, the efforts the Army and, and the Pacific Command commander are doing with ground forces in the Pacific. A lot being written about that these days. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, again, it, go it goes to this concept of regional engagement. 
uh, and, and, and making sure, so, you know, the, the bottom line is everybody, you know, talks about why is the Army all of a sudden in the Pacific? The Army's always been in the Pacific. I remind everybody of that. We have 82,000 soldiers assigned to PACOM, and I didn't increase that. It's been that way forever. What I did do, though, is I brought them back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and we haven't deployed them to Afghanistan over the last 18 months. So they are now there in the Pacific being able to assist the PACOM commander in meeting his objectives. And so what they're doing is they're developing programs that allow them to accomplish the objectives of the PACOM commander, whether, and, and whether it be in Korea or whether it be in Thailand or whether it be in Australia or whether it be wherever in the Pacific. And they are building packages that allow him to accomplish the objectives that he has. And he's incredibly supportive of what we're doing because it's helped him simply. For example, First Corps has been certified as the, as the combined land component command in the Pacific. They haven't been able to do that in years and years and years because First Corps was busy in Iraq. So we're now able to dedicate them and he can be assured that they will stay there with him. And so that's enabling us now to do the things that we should be doing in the Pacific. And it's key. And that's part of this regional engagement that is so, so important. Um, and, you know, and then obviously we're worried. We continue to work and make sure we build the readiness necessary in the Korean Peninsula. What else? Anybody else? Let's hear it for the chief. Thank you.